this is kind of good because they said short elders meet. And we always tell the lies if it's not, somebody told the story. Now they have to have a short elders meet. So that means all the elders have to become smaller. Our discussion this evening centers on this subject, walking the way of integrity. And you know, the Webster's Dictionary makes an interesting comment about this term integrity. It says, adherence to a code of values or completeness. And you know, in the world today, um, you think about that, people say maybe they sell an item. Or for a particular company, they say buy from that company because it has integrity. You know, nowadays, uh, there aren't many companies, though, that can really say they have integrity. Sometimes we buy a new item, and within so many weeks, you're calling up home. The repairman. Or you may buy a new vehicle, and within a few days, now I appreciate this, uh, sometimes as traveling brothers, when we get our new cars, and I still remember this, I was picking up my car at a particular place in the Midwest, and another brother was with me, and as we drove out of the parking lot, now these were brand new cars that had been fully inspected, and they stamped inspected, and as we were driving out, the transmission fell out of the car. You know, you think about integrity there. You know, how did that car get that far? But you see, that's in a worldly sense. See, we need to understand that as far as that word is concerned. See, as far as integrity, because sometimes in the truth we use that term, we say, well, completeness. But in the truth, that term is used, and it's noteworthy in the insight book as to how that word is defined. It says there, it has to do with devotion, unbreakable devotion to a person, and that is true of God. It has to do with his expressed will, his purpose, and then you and I are willing to live our life accordingly. So no matter what happens in our lives, we now maintain integrity to God. And I would ask you this, does that mean life is going to be perfect, we'll have no problems? No, we're talking about every aspect of our life in the truth. See, so maybe we learn the truth and we have very good health, and in the process of things, in the course of time, and the truth, maybe now, many years later, we now deal with health issues. And the Bible still says that that course of integrity is important to all of us. See, that completeness to Jehovah God and the things that we do as far as our lives. So it has to do with our heart devotion to Jehovah God. And the Bible indicates that you and I really need to be thinking about that as far as what we do. If you'd like to look at something in the book of Psalms, Psalm 119, you notice there in verse one, in chapter 119, we, don't, we want to just read the first three verses there. It says, Happy are the ones faultless in their way, the ones walking in the law of Jehovah. Happy are those observing his reminders with all the heart they keep searching for him. Really, they have practiced no unrighteousness. It says, in his ways they have walked. Now, the Bible indicates here that as far as you and I and as Christians, it says the person is happy. That's number one. But it says they're happy for a reason. You notice what it is? It says, here's this individual walking in the law of Jehovah God. And they appreciate his reminders. They keep searching for them. The Bible says here in verse 3 says... In his ways they have walked. So they don't deviate. And in order to learn what Jehovah's ways are and how they apply, that indicates a person basically has to take time to really understand what Jehovah's laws are. And how do we do that? Through study. We have to understand what the Bible says about the Jehovah God, his ways, and like it says, his, his reminders, so that you and I can walk with him. And it's not a lonely course. The Bible indicates here that Jehovah God in turn walks with us, well, walks with us in the things that we do. So that indicates we learn these things. It's like tonight's lesson said. A person can talk an awful lot about love. They really can. I mean, we could go on and on and on for hours, like tonight's lesson said, about here's what Jehovah's done for us. And many of our friends can comment about that. But you know, made an interesting point at the end when it summed it all up by saying, well, yes, we might may love Jehovah God, but... How about our brothers and sisters? You see, some of our friends can't stand being with certain people. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. It's evident by their life course and the way they do things, and yet they say they love God. So you see, this term integrity comes into play when we say that because integrity applies to all aspects of human conduct. 
See, how we react to things and how we react to people that Jehovah God loves, as far as life is concerned. And it's an unswerving devotion to righteousness. You see, we don't say, well, okay, today it's all right that I follow this course, but tomorrow I want to deviate and do what I want to do as far as life. We're unswerving in our devotion to Jehovah God and the things that we do. Now, that requires uh, two things. Number one is this. It requires the right heart motivation. And we're going to add this to that. The right heart motivation. And if the heart is motivated right, you see, that leads to the proper action. That would be point number one. So motivated right, so we take the right action. And point number two would be this. We're willing to embrace all the commands that Jehovah God gives us. We love him. And I thought this was interesting, the way this is worded. We embrace Jehovah then and his laws and his commands with our whole heart, mind, and soul. Every fiber of us now is involved in serving Jehovah properly. And we love him. We want to keep integrity to him in the things that we do. Now, that is not easy. It's a challenge as far as life is concerned. If you remember, 1 John 5, 19 indicates that the whole world is lying in the power of the wicked one. So we've got a lot of influences to deal with as far as our day-to-day -day lives and the things around us. The world has very low moral standards. And those moral standards really don't. If a Christian were to follow them, they do not promote integrity as far as lives are concerned. And in many cases, people don't care about what other people are doing. They basically tell you this, you know what, as long as this makes you happy and it doesn't bother me, then what's your concern? Just kind of leave it alone and move on. And yet the Bible doesn't teach that. So here's what the Bible says with regard to God's standards on morals. Something else, too, is... It's bad traits. They don't build integrity. Now, if you were to look at 2 Timothy, the third chapter, verses 1 through 5, look what it is that the world is promoting. It talks there about the love of money, greedy, dishonest gain, liars, blasphemers. You know, it's not unusual for people to lie about anything. Now, think about that when it comes to work. Uh, one person was telling me this. The gentleman, he was, we were talking, and we were just talking about how people sometimes don't tell the truth. He says, well, you know, it's not such a bad thing, because we were talking, remember the article about, do we always need to tell the truth that we have in the watchtower? So the man was engaging in conversation, and he says, you know, it's not a bad thing from time to time to just kind of fudge on something. He said, for example, this. And he told me about one time he was late for work. He overslept. He just didn't want to get up. And so he overslept. Well, the man waited for him. It was his normal ride. And while they were riding to work, they both knew they were going to be late. And the other man said to him, well, what are we going to tell the boss? And he says, well, let's just tell him we got caught in traffic. He said, well, that's a lie. Well, no, it isn't. He's not going to check the traffic reports. He says, now, if we tell him we slept in and we don't want to come to work, you know what he may tell us? He'll fire us. So they were willing to lie. And you know what? You work around people like that who kind of like to tell little stories like that to get off. You see what influence that could have on a person at work? I think of young people at school. They listen to young people tell all kinds of stories, even lie to their parents about where they're going. They don't tell them the truth. Because if I tell my parents the truth, they won't let me do it, and I may get caught. There's an example in the Watchtower where the world's influence on one of our young brothers at school, the young people basically told him, why don't you come to a party with us after school? He says, well, no, I shouldn't. Oh, it won't be bad. You just need to come. You know what? Your parents don't need to know. Just tell them you're staying after school. So he did. And he went. And the sad consequences of it was, as he went to the party, he did not know marijuana and other drugs were in the house. And the other young people were using them. And it just so happened that somebody called the police because this party was going on at certain hours. And the police came, and they arrested everybody in the house. And while the young man was not using the drugs because he was there, he knew what was going on, and they told him he was an accomplice, and so guess what he got? He now has a record with the police. But imagine how his parents must have felt when they got the phone call telling him they had to come down and pick him up at the jailhouse. And he said he was staying after school to catch up on some work. So you see, the influence is there. And even our young people are tested as to their integrity for what's right. And knowing what Jehovah says is right to do as far as their lives are concerned. 
And also, Satan uses other things. He uses persecution. He uses opposition, sometimes worldly influence, sometimes our own tendencies, just to get you and I to leave the way of integrity. Now, the one who wrote Psalm 119 was David. And if you remember, David's heart on occasion did not stay where it should with Jehovah God. 1 Kings 9, 4, though, says, in heart he walked with Jehovah God. Now, why can that be said? In spite of the fact that his flesh took over, because whenever David was confronted with his wrongs, the Bible tells us his spirit about him. He was contrite, he was sorry, and Jehovah God could read that in heart about him. And he was forgiven. There were consequences to his course, but he was forgiven. So despite the influence of the world around us, the Bible indicates, and David indicates that, that you and I can walk with integrity of heart. And we can walk in the way of integrity as far as serving Jehovah God is concerned. It will not be easy. And we're going to add a few other things into this. Like we said, the God of the system of things, there's persecution, there's opposition, worldly influence, sinful tendencies, and we're going to add a few other things. So the outline mentions these. We have now dealing with health issues. And those health issues can encompass any number of things in our lives. So now the question is, will we keep our integrity in serving God? See, as these health issues affect us, will it slow us down? Will we look for ways to get out of serving Jehovah God? Or will we keep our integrity and do what we're asked to do in serving Jehovah this time? So for the next few minutes, we said David was such a person that he maintained integrity despite other issues in his life. What we'd like to do is just review Psalm 26. And the Bible writer here is David. What we're going to read about is his integrity, what he saw as a need to maintain integrity in the time in which he was living, the parallels for you and I, as far as our lives and the things that we do. So here in Psalm 26, you'll notice right away in verse 1, David says, Judge me, O Jehovah, for I myself have walked in my own integrity, and in Jehovah I have trusted that I may not walk. Now here's a good question to ask ourselves. When was the last time, not judge us, but we asked Jehovah God to examine our heart motive? To actually look at us and determine, you see, what is the motivation behind what we're doing as far as serving in this concern? And that's good because you see what verse 2 says, Examine me, O Jehovah, put me to the test, refine my kidneys and my heart. And so are we willing to let Jehovah God do that, examine us? Now, some... And with us, it's once a year. You have to go see a doctor and get a physical. And you know, as you get older, the doctors come up with all kinds of tests. I call them atrocities that can be done to the body. <laughs> fact, as you get older, I didn't know they could do all the things they could do. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's done. And the point is, uh, sometimes whether we want to have it done or not, the doctor says this should be done. And it's for preventive means. Because if they can find things early now, they can treat them. But you see, if we let it alone, it can have an adverse effect on us. Now, physically speaking, that doctor may examine us. And you know what he may tell us? <coughs> I find this and this wrong with you. Now, I think you're going to walk out of that office and say, well, yes, he found a tumor here and a tumor there. That's <coughs> okay. It's only two. <laughs> I know. We're going, to, we're going to think about what he said. And he may even tell us the way they're situated and where they're at. They could lead to this problem and this problem. You may say, I don't think they're malignant. But if you let them grow, they're going to create other problems in their life. Well, now, would you think about it? Would you go and maybe get a second opinion? Or would you just go home and think, well, until they do that, I'm not going to worry about it. I think, well, then what was the reason for paying all that money to get that done? Then? Just to ignore what this doctor said? And so the same question could be asked of us when we ask Jehovah God to examine us. If Jehovah shows us through his word, the Bible, or others, that there are flaw areas in our life. The question is, will we refine ourselves like it says here in kidneys? Because remember, kidneys and the heart, kidneys are the innermost part of the body. That's the inner core of us. And if the inner core of us is affecting the heart and the motivation of what we do, are we willing to make adjustments? I think about like the book study tonight. Remember the next to the last paragraph it says, has this and this and this caused us to lose that love that we once had for the truth? It said money, job, and entertainment. See, they're, they're common things, but the question is, does that take first priority in our life? 
as we realize it is, and we're not tired from kingdom interest, but we're just tired from living our life the way we want to lead it, then the question is, what will we do with that spiritual examination? <coughs> will we work to make improvement, or won't we? Now, what's interesting is this, because sometimes when we serve circuits, about every three to four years, the branch tells all traveling brothers that the records that we keep on the congregations are to be, so to speak, emptied out and let the next brother coming in start fresh. Sometimes traveling brothers forget to take those records out. And they may leave anywhere from three to six to nine to ten to twelve years of records in a book. In some circuits I've gone into, I've actually had up to ten years of records and you know what we see about the congregation? That's 10 years, that's at least three traveling brothers, sometimes four, and the congregation has never made changes. Never. You know what the problems were all 10 years? Low meeting attendance, poor ministry, lots of irregularity and activity, and yet we've gotten all these reminders, we're told to make a self-examination, and for 10 to 12, we make no change. And what do you think that's telling Jehovah God as a congregation and an individual about us? So do we, are we willing to let Jehovah examine us? And that's the first part of this verse because that's the key element of all of this. It's not examining somebody else and saying, you know, this person needs to make that adjustment. Yeah, they need to. No. It has to do with us. See, what am I willing to do to make adjustments as far as my lives are concerned? Now you notice there in verse 3 it says, for your loving kindness is in front of my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. I have not sat with men of untruth, and with those who hide what they are, I do not come in. He says, I have hated the congregation of evildoers, and with the wicked ones I do not sit. And he says, I shall wash my hands in innocency itself, and I will march around your altar, O Jehovah, to cause thanksgiving to be heard aloud, and to declare all your wonderful works. Now, according to the reading here in verse 3, David says that he walked in God's truth. So he constantly kept Jehovah's acts of loving kindness in front of his eyes. And the question is this, how could he know Jehovah's truth? So you see, he says there, your loving kindness is in front of my eyes and I've walked in your truth, unless he took time to study God's word. So one key element in maintaining integrity is study. Now I would ask you this question, if we told you to put your name on your book tonight, and then send them to the middle out, and we collected all of them and put them up with your name. What would we find? See, was the material study? Do we look it up? Do we look the verses up to understand all these different scriptures, the interplay of the Bible with other parts of the Bible? And do we understand the book of Revelation and its correlation to the congregations today and all these things that we see going on back there have bearing on what's going on today? Do we study it that way? Do we meditate on it? And for some of our friends, study's not an easy thing, but the point is, are we willing to take the time to study God's Word? And if we study God's Word, you'll notice like that next verse said, it has a profound effect on who we choose to associate with. So we're not going to choose to be with people that are inclined to do wrong things. You may say, well, I don't choose to be with them. Well, maybe we don't realize this, but maybe we do. It may not have to do with literal people, but you know what? When you turn that TV on, who are you associating? What kind of people will we associate with? People that lead immoral lives? People that promote immorality, a loose way of living, uh, committing fornication on TV, and sometimes say, well, you don't see the whole thing. You don't have to. You may see a person embrace in one scene and then quickly change as it gets dark, and the next thing you know is you see them exiting what when the telephone rings to bed. And they're not married people. We just watch what? And we didn't think there was anything bad with it because, you know what, sometimes we even tell the friends, you know what, I watched this cute little romantic movie that comes on again, you need to watch it. Really? See, who do we choose to associate with, like the Bible says here, as far as our lives are concerned? And when it comes to these areas, so the TV, even individuals that may feign friendship with us, do we realize what could happen as far as our lives are concerned? Because some individuals will do that. Even individuals, like we talked about in the lesson tonight, apostates. And you know, we hate to say this, but sometimes, even in the congregation, we have to be careful with whom we associate with. 
because some of our friends don't have the right attitude about meetings. They see no problem in missing. If you're tired, you stay home. And they see no problem in the fact that, you know what, so what if the brothers tell us we need to study? You know what, you do what you want to do. And I'm not going to be regular in the ministry. Nobody's going to tell me what I have to do. That's their attitude. And I think, well, that's like today's text said. They've got an independent attitude. So would you want to associate with people who don't see the need to be active and want to serve Jehovah properly? And some even kind of promote little feelings about that. They'll talk about things like the outline mentions here. Some of these folks get together and talk about a point of service, it says. They don't like the way they do this or how they handle that. This was done right. That wasn't done right. You don't think Jehovah hears that? And the outline makes mention of that. But see, that kind of association we have to be aware of. See, what they're promoting, because it almost could look like they're saying, but you see, if I were in there, I'd do what? Well, I'd correct all of this. I think, well, you've got the wrong viewpoint right there. You forget your Jesus Christ is in charge of the congregations. He will correct it in his time, not us. But we think, no, I have to do it. I've been assigned to do it. No, you haven't. And you are undermining the peace, and I appreciate somebody made a comment tonight about the cleanness of the congregation because that does undermine the cleanness of the congregation. Because nobody has the fortitude to tell this person who now is talking about even appointed brothers, you are wrong, wrong, wrong. And Jehovah's hearing you. I would be afraid, afraid, afraid. Because he's also reading the heart of that person when we talk. So that's a good reminder to us that who we pick and choose as associates can have a profound effect on how we view things spiritually and the way we care for ourselves. And David said, I choose not to be with this kind of person. Now, how do you learn that? It all goes back to study. See, is this in harmony with God's word or is it out of harmony with God's word and what it says? And then later on in this, uh, he proclaimed his devotion to Jehovah. You'll notice that in verse 6 that we just read, he said around March, he would march around his altar and so his devotion was uh, wanting to be acceptable to Jehovah God. And you and I can march around God's altar today by exercising faith in Jesus' sacrifice. And the merit of it as far as our lives are concerned. Verse 7 says there to cause thanksgiving to be heard aloud and to declare all your wonderful works. And then he says in verse 8, Jehovah, I have loved the dwelling of your house and the place of your residing, the residing of your glory. So uh, we appreciate that we can cause this thanksgiving to be heard, like verse 7 says, by our public ministry. Now, we'd like to mention something to the congregation, because usually Thursday night is the night we talk to the congregation about areas that they might want to consider. There are two areas that the congregation may want to give consideration to. Number one is what verse 7 says, they're hearing this thanksgiving aloud. The question we have to ask ourselves individually is this, am I active in kingdom? Now you have 170 plus cards in the plow. And we're happy to have some friends with us here now who have moved in, but their cards aren't exactly in the file yet. So within a few months, you may hear the elders say to you that we have over 180 publishers here, and they're going to be right. Now the question is, are we all having an active share in the ministry? If we're dedicated, baptized, maybe we're an unbaptized publisher, you see, do we see the need for every month to be active in the congregation? And it's noteworthy in the congregation that you have a high rate of irregularity and inactivity out of 171 publishers. And about, we were mentioning this to the elders last night, if you add it all up, 70-some percent of the congregation is below your congregation out of the average, which is eight hours. And 29% are above that. And that includes your pioneers, your auxiliary pioneers. So it gives us something to think about. You see, where am I at in all of this? See, we're not giving an hourly figure, but I think, you know, if we don't see the value of being active in the ministry, that's one of the points here that talks about keeping our integrity to Jehovah God. So do we make every attempt to be regular? And I thought about that because the outline says even with sickness, we can keep integrity. There's ways to keep integrity in the ministry, even in illness. We read an experience to the pioneers this evening, and the experience had to do with a sister. She was 59 years of age. 
She was writing the branch that she could not attend the Pioneer School for a reason. And she's still a regular Pioneer, but she said, and the reason was being that she had muscular dystrophy and she had now um, gotten to the point where she had to literally be lifted out of her bed at a certain hour of the day and not by a person, but there was a machine that lifted her out of the bed and put her in a wheelchair. But up till 10.30 for about three hours while she was still in the bed, she wrote letters to people in the territory. And then she would get up at 10.30, be put in the wheelchair, and then for another two hours she would do that, write letters again, and carry on her ministry with regard to that. And then she would clean the house, and believe this or not, she then worked part-time because her husband was a non-believer and she spent a lot on postage and didn't want to put a burden on him with regard to the postage that she used. And then she would be put back in the bed at 4.30 and then not to leave the bed the rest of the day. She couldn't. But she served as a regular pioneer. And I thought about that and has and... She, she wasn't able to attend the school because, you see, she couldn't get out during the hours of the school. Was The branch made concession for her and arranged other things. But the point is, imagine, even in this health, she sought out ways to maintain her integrity in certain job. So what about us in our areas of life? So do we look for ways to talk about Jehovah? And if we're an integrity keeper, that is one thing that we would desire to do, is to talk about him as far as our lives are concerned. And then, like it mentions here also, the need to be at the meetings. You'll notice that point that was made in verse 8. It says, I love the dwelling of your house. Now, again, this is point number 2. And point number 2 to work on would be this. It is noted that out of 170 publishers, your midweek meetings have anywhere from 40 to 50 people missing. Now, we wonder, see, do we appreciate the meetings and being in Jehovah's house? And what do the meetings do? Well, they fortify us. I, I might say something to you. You know, you may come here to this kingdom hall, and I know a lot of our friends are under a lot of pressure. Got a lot of things to deal with. And they've got health issues, just a host of things. You may walk into this kingdom hall, and your mind may be weighed down with hundreds of things. You may even just walk in here being depressed because you are dealing with the things you're dealing with. And you may sit here in this kingdom hall. And you know what? If a brother came up to you after the meeting and asked you what you learned, you know what you may tell them? I don't remember a thing. But you know what Jehovah knows? You could have stayed where? Home. But seeing the need to be obedient and keep integrity and walking in Jehovah's way, you came to the kingdom home. I'll tell you what. Jehovah cannot but bless that in our course of life. You see, the effort we put forth to be here despite all of this. And like I said, we may think we didn't get anything out of the meeting, but unknowingly, you know what? Somebody may have said a kind word to us. Maybe we just said something to somebody who was even feeling worse than we did, and we strengthened them that night. But imagine staying home and getting nothing spiritually at all. So how is that going to benefit us and provide the help that we need in maintaining our integrity? Now, there is a warning given give here. It says we need to love Jehovah's reminders and we need the association of one another at the kingdom hall. Now, I appreciate that. I, one watchtower said this, that loving assistance comes through the congregation. And it really does. We need one another. The book of Proverbs mentions that in the 17th chapter. It says there in verse 17 that uh, we need the association of one another. It talks about a true companion is one who loves. Even in time of trouble, they become like a brother, better than a brother or sister would be. But you know, we need the meetings and we need one another for a reason. If you get an opportunity and you have some time to read, we encourage on occasion to read various publications. One of them is the 1974 yearbook. It's also used as part of the instruction, the 74 and 75 yearbooks, in instructing in the Gilead class. They ask the friends to read certain things because it stresses the need of why we need to be here and why we cannot afford to be away from one another. And one of the experiences, in fact, a number of them in there, are related to our brothers and sisters during World War II in Nazi Germany. And especially when the Allied troops came in, and now all these concentration camps were opened up, but the German soldiers decided they weren't going to let anybody go free. 
And remember those yearbooks talk about, the 74 yearbook talks about how they did these death marches. They actually took them from the concentration camps, <coughs> were marching them to the sea in some instances, and they said anybody who falls, who cannot walk, they are to be shot on sight. Thousands were shot. But you know what the yearbook says? Not one brother or sister lost their life. And you know why? It mentions some of these friends. Now, if you're going to picture this, years of not eating properly, beaten, malnourished, unhealthy, and our friends looked at emaciated, as well as many others that were in the concentration camps. And here they are, they're on this march. And it's said that on occasion, some of the friends, our brothers and sisters there, would just collapse on the road. They collapse. And the experience says that other friends would look at them. Now, can you imagine... 90 pounds is 90 pounds, but 90 pounds of a human is dead weight when you have to pick it up. You maybe weigh 100 pounds yourself. And the experiences tell you, literally, these friends pick them up and put them on their backs, and they carry them. Some of them got heavy-duty wooden wheelbarrows. They didn't have the strength for themselves, and they put these friends in there, and they kind of say, they wheel them to their safety. And I think, now, how about you and I? Do we appreciate the meetings? And do we love one another here? Remember we said at the beginning of the talk, one of the problems sometimes is, we don't love one another like we really say we do. Can't stand being with certain people. They kind of turn us the wrong way. And maybe they've done things that we didn't like and say, you know what, we just can't forget that. But I think, now imagine if we were put in those situations. Could you say you loved your brother? if you can't stand being with them. Would you carry them on your back? See, the meetings train us, and they help us to appreciate one another. Now, there is a warning given in the 26th Psalm with regard to not maintaining integrity, starting in verse 9. Here in verse 9, it says, Do not take away my soul along with sinners, nor my life along with blood-guilty men, in whose hands there is loose conduct, and in whose right hand is full of bribery. And then in verse 11, he simply says, As for me and my integrity, I shall walk, or redeem me and show me favor. But verses uh, 8 and 9 and 10 tell us, or rather 9 and 10 tell us, the warning is to be careful about who and what it is that we associate with again. And uh, David here was concerned with the fact that he didn't want to lose his life walking with sinners. So when it comes to walking in integrity, we need to be careful that we don't become involved in loose conduct like in the world today. Like we said, there are just a host of things. That includes the magazines that we read, the movies that we watch, all of them promote this, the internet. Some of our young people are hooked up on some of these chat rooms. Some of them are hooked up to other areas where various things go on. And even the world has said they're dangerous to be in. And so do we appreciate the need to stay clear of these things? And remember, youth are especially susceptible to immoral influences. Many young people are led to think that they need to begin dating early in life. And so parents, do we train our children? Dating is for marriage. And they need to be mature. They need to be able to handle matters. So are we training them properly with regard to marriage? And uh, all too often, and we see this sometimes in the congregation, They get involved romantically early. They're too young to marry. And the next thing we hear is announcements made in the congregation. So-and-so reproved. And some have to be disfellowshipped because of their immoral conduct. And it also entails our adults. They need to be careful with regard to their integrity to Jehovah when it comes to marriage. That if they don't keep integrity, it could lead to infidelity and divorce. You see, and the Bible talks about that as to how Jehovah feels about those things. We need to be careful about our business practices. You see, we, some lack could end up lacking integrity when it comes to being not honest in the way they handle business matters. But one watchtower that's referred here mentions the individuals who constantly are making loans to buy things, getting bigger and better things. And they get themselves into heavy debt because of it. Some will even go to other brothers and ask for it, and the Watch the article here mentions that even the brothers doing the lending need to be careful. Because you're encouraging folks to maybe get into debt by lending this way. 
So that's why in Amos, the fifth chapter, in verse 15, it tells us that we never want to allow corrupting influences to take root in our hearts. Because there it says, hate what is bad, love what is good. And we need to remain in Jehovah's favor by the things that we do. And when we do this, it only deepens our heartfelt love for Jehovah God, and in turn, we are willing to be integrity keepers to Jehovah God. And what a marvelous thing to think about is that in our modern day society, well over 6.6 .6 million of Jehovah's people today are striving and working hard to walk in the way of integrity. He's striving to maintain what they do in serving Jehovah God. And when we do that, and we want to continue to walk in the way of Jehovah God, our manner of life will show that we respect and appreciate what Jehovah God has done for us and his sovereignty as far as our lives are concerned. And in the book of uh, Psalm, the psalmist makes this comment in concluding there in Psalm 26 and verse 11. He says, As for me and my integrity I shall walk. Oh, redeem me and show me favor. My foot, my own foot will certainly stand on a level place and among the congregated throng, throngs I will bless Jehovah. So as the Bible indicates here, you and I can enjoy these blessings. And uh, if we allow Jehovah God to be a part of our lives, we see the need for study of his word. We see the value of the ministry. We see the meetings as important in our life. All of these things are going to help us to maintain integrity. And we're never going to allow Satan to entice us into situations that could cause us to ruin and jeopardize our relationship with Jehovah God. And as the outline concludes here, may our way of life always reflect the inspired words found at Psalm 26, 11 and 12. That our desire will be to walk with Jehovah God, maintain our integrity, and enjoy the promises that he's held out for the future. Maybe now you'd like to stand, please. We're going to conclude with Psalm number 160.